they may take our lives, but they'll never take our freedom! We're on a mission from God. I'm entitled. You want answers! I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! Maybe we should chug on over to Mamby Pamby Land, where maybe we can find some self-confidence for you, you jackwagon! Coming to you live from his padded cell high atop Bethel Church, the most heralded, the most despised talk show in all of human history. This is the talk show Hell Hates. This is Pastor Mike Online. And here we are coming to you live from our top secret broadcasting research facility. This is Pastor Mike and I'm online and live with you today. Um, we're, I'm going to go ahead and do as much as I can today on what I had talked about Tuesday and I even mentioned it last night. I'm going to have to leave a little bit early today. I have a doctor's appointment and uh, so if you would just pray for me and because I've got a lot of pain in my left side and it feels like if you've ever had a hernia and what it is, I, I found it's, it's congenital. You inherit a weakness in your abdominal wall. And I've already had one of those right around my belly button. And I noticed this little bulge sticking out next to my belly button. And I would push it in. It would go in. But after a while, it would come back out again. I went, what in the world is that? So that was about uh, 16 years ago. So I had uh, hernia repair then. And just in the last couple months... If I like lean down, uh, sometimes I do it the wrong way or I'm leaning, whatever, it, it will pop out again in a different place. And I think it's bigger this time. And of course, when your intestines poke through that wall that's meant to keep them separate from your skin, it's like your muscle layer is like a protection. Um, it blocks off your intestines and it can be quite painful so i talked to sweetie pie and we're gonna leave here uh before too long and go see the doctor and see what he has to say about it on tuesday we were talking about the seven trumpets um, what is their significance uh, of course, it's real easy to see that uh, things in the book of Revelation seem to go in sevens. You have the seven churches, you have the seven candlesticks, you have the seven stars, the seven spirits of God. You have, uh, let's see, what else related to the number? So, oh, the, the seven seals that are on the book. The seven trumpets, the seven uh, vials of wrath that are poured out uh, at the end time. And a little theory that I have of the entirety of human history is that, uh, and I think there's no doubt God designed it this way, when God did his work in the Garden of Eden, uh, Genesis chapter 2 plainly says, that God did that work in six days, and then on the seventh day, he rested from all his work, he finished that work, he hallowed that seventh day and sanctified it. And so there's a commandment. Uh, the fourth commandment says, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. Now, for all of our Seventh-day Adventist friends out there, At no time does God ever command anybody that they have to have a church service only on the seventh day and they can't have a church service any other time. It doesn't say that. And some say, well, you know, keeping the Sabbath and making it holy 
they would say, does that not mean that God wants us to go and worship him on the seventh day in order to keep the Sabbath day holy? You might be able to, you know, pull that out of that text. The problem is it doesn't say that. It actually tells you in the 70th chapter of the Bible, which is Exodus 20. This is God's spoken word, and all of Israel heard it, and they ran away like scared little children from the presence of Almighty God. And so they heard that voice on that day. They heard the very voice of God, 70th chapter of the Bible, and God specifically said to remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Then right after that, he then tells us exactly what he meant when he said remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. He says, six days shalt thou work and do all thy labor. But the seventh day is a rest. Even God rested on the seventh day. So, and I've had numerous conversations with people. Some of them have been very, very uh, receptive to what I said because I would ask the question, can you find me anywhere in the law where it says I can only have a church service on Saturday and I cannot have it on any other day? And the answer is no. There is no place in the Bible where there is a commandment that we must gather together and worship the Lord on the seventh day of the week. There's nothing there. And the rule is from Scripture, if the Scripture doesn't, specifically uh, render it as sin and disobedience to God, then it's not a sin. Think of our first parents, Adam and Eve. When they were in the Garden of Eden, God gave one commandment, just one. And that commandment was that Adam was not to eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That was the commandment. That was it. And so from that commandment, we get into the Mosaic law, the laws of Moses and the statutes and judgments and commandments and everything else. And again, we see in that passage that God does not demand that we go to church on Saturday or the Sabbath day. And that's how God wants us to keep the Sabbath day holy. That's not what it says. And if the Bible doesn't tell you that that's what you have to do, then there is a liberty in our lives. The law does not, God's Christ's perfect law of liberty does not put us in bondage. It gives us the freedom and the desire of our heart to honor God and to keep his commandments. So, if you just, and I've had people call me and they just rake me up one side down the other and they judge me. Uh, you're not a Sabbath keeper. You, why, why do you go to church on the pagan Sunday? Yeah, it's named after the sun, isn't it? That's why we don't do it because it's named after the sun. Uh, uh, excuse me. Um, it wasn't named after the sun in the Bible. The Bible just simply called it the first day of the week. But if you want to get technical about it, so is Saturn's day. Because that's where the word Saturday came from. It was named after the seventh, uh, what is it, the seventh, seventh planet or something like that. Saturn was the last planet that we could physically see with our eyes um, up until years later when they perfected these telescopes and they could see that there's Neptune or Uranus and then Neptune after Saturn, two two planets that we had no idea was even there until, let's say, the last 150 or so years. That's just a guess on my part, but it's been that long. And uh, so anyway, if you're going to get technical about how we go to church on the sun God's day, well, you go to church on Saturn's day. So there's really not any moral high ground for you to stand on on that issue. And again, I've had I've had people call me and they've asked me, you know, why, how come you don't go to church on the Saturday? And I would say, if you can show me in the law 
Because when I stand before God in judgment, I'm not going to be, God's not going to be asking for witnesses from everybody in heaven. Do you know this guy named Mike Hoggard? Yeah, we all know him. Well, come up here and tell us how come he doesn't keep the Sabbath. I'm not going to be judged by people. I'm going to be judged on the basis of what is in God's word, his laws and his statutes. And it is so blaringly clear that the Sabbath day, God instructed us on how to keep the Sabbath day holy. So these people accuse me. Oh, Pastor, you break the Sabbath. You break the. And I always say to them, can I ask you a question? Yeah. How is it that you know so much about what I do on Saturday? Well, you don't go to church, do you? That's not what I asked. What is it that you know about me that you know what I do on Saturdays? And then you hear this long pause. I said, what I do when the seventh day rolls around, that's my day off. That's my day off. And it's literally um, every Saturday, my wife, Sweetie Pie, uh, takes her mother out shopping every Saturday. First Saturday we were married. My wife and her mother, Lisa, got up Saturday morning. I said, where are you going? She said, I'm going grocery shopping with mom. And I'm going, oh, I thought maybe we could do something. Well, no, I can't do anything with you. I got to go with me. She's been doing that ever since she was young. So Saturday, they go shopping, and on Saturday, I got the house to myself. And you know what I do? Almost nothing. I may study a little bit. Saturday night is usually my best study time to get ready for Sunday. But I spend Saturday resting. I'm not doing any servile labor for anybody. Uh... Yeah, I still make the bed, but no big deal. Um, but God made it very clear that Sabbath keeping had everything to do with refraining from work or servile labor, refraining from that and resting on that day because God rested on that day. So remember the seventh day to keep it holy. Six days, shut that work and do all thy labor. But the seventh day is a day of rest. And he told us and commanded us to do that. Now, then some would say, well, we're not under the law. I know. But the law's still good. And as mature Bible-believing Christians, we don't, we don't keep the Sabbath out of a sense of strict obedience to God. He's not making us keep his Sabbath. He's giving us a free will. And those who truly love the Lord with all their heart, they set aside a day to rest themselves. Jesus said the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. And so, and I've shared that with people, but others, they just, they just want to knock me down. They want to try to prove how right they are. And I remember telling a guy one time, I, I did that. I said, if you can show me in the Bible where I'm only going to church on Saturday, but I can't go to church on any other day, then I'd gladly do that. Well, it says keep the, I, he said it's right there in Genesis, Exodus 20. It says keep the Sabbath. I said, I know it says that. But it doesn't say that in keeping the Sabbath, I have to Go to a church service on Saturday. It doesn't say that. It doesn't any, look anything like that. It says the way to keep the Sabbath is to rest on that Sabbath day. God gave it to us as a benefit. Knowing that we could literally work ourselves to death if we were to do servile labor seven days a week. I mean, after a while, you just get so burnt out, you can't do anything. Well, that's that's how it is with some people. I don't think it's that way with all people. That's the way it is with some people. But I make a voluntary effort to do as little as possible on Saturday because God gave that day to me in order for me to rest. Um, 
here lately, if I am being called to preach a revival somewhere or I'm going to do a conference somewhere or going to Kenya, I always try to make sure that I get back home by Friday so that I can spend the next day recovering from the travel, the jet lag, the fatigue of going from one airport to another or different things or the, you know, driving brings about a fatigue. And so it's that choice that I want my body to rest. I want my mind, <clears throat> excuse me, to rest. And I recognize that God gave us that day as a benefit to us. Now, it is a commandment. However, if I already do willingly what I want to do in order to please God in some way, I do it by faith, and I do it not, not because I have to or because I'm made to. I do it because that's what's in my heart. I do it because I want to. And herein lies really the key to understanding the law of the Old Testament. When we were children, we were tossed to and fro. And when we're children, foolishness was bound in our hearts and the rod of correction had to drive it far from us. And when we're children, we don't do things that because we want to. We do them because we're being made to do them. If given a choice, most children would choose not to go to school. But by the time they're an adult, they realize they made a huge mistake. And even my mother, who did not graduate high school as an adult, she did the study courses and she got her GED, General Equivalency Diagnostic or something like that. Anyways, it, it was a way to have a high school diploma without actually going to a high school. She didn't do this. Because dad was making her, I was making her, or God was making her do it. She did it because she wanted to do it. She wanted to have that completion in her life of graduating school. She did it because she wanted to do it. Why is it, why is it that some of you have not had an affair, an adulterous relationship outside of your marital bonds with your spouse? Why is it that you didn't do that? I mean, surely the temptation has been there, hasn't it? Surely you have set your eyes upon another man or another woman and said, boy, she's pretty or he's really good looking. My 40-year-old babe's got his old belly hanging out over the side. That guy, I mean, he's got it going, you know. But we don't go chasing after that. Why? Because we don't want to dishonor and bring dishonor and contempt to God or his commandments. We don't want to hurt our spouse. And so it falls under the category of the law of liberty that James talked about. The perfect law of liberty. Whereas Jesus gave us two commandments to follow. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Love your neighbor as yourself. And both of them require love. True, genuine love. And so if you love the Lord... You don't have a problem keeping those Old Testament statutes and judgments because you're doing them because you realize they're the right thing to do and you want to do them in order to give yourself a sense of satisfaction that you did what you really felt God commanded us to do. And I, I want to strongly encourage everybody take a day off. Even in the ministry. And I know a lot of ministers are worse about this than anybody. Well, Saturday's the day we go door knocking. Or Saturday's the day we have church work day. Or Saturday's the day, uh, you know, we run the bus routes, pick up, or whatever. But even in the ministry, especially ministers in the ministry, seem to think that the greater good is done by us working seven days a week. Whereas all that's going to lead to is being burnt up. You're burning a candle at both ends and it won't last very long. <clears throat> so I do these things because that's where my heart is. I do it because I want to. Not because I have to. Let's say that 
from here till the rest of the end of my life, situations come about that I have to work a job six days a week or seven days a week. Okay? Can I still be saved by grace through faith? Yep. But when you are truly born again, God puts a spirit of his son in your hearts. And just as Jesus said, as I have kept my father's commandments, so you keep my commandments. My two commandments are love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. So the greater good is served by even the man of God taking time off for himself. If you're a real man of God, you are a servant. Even though you've been put in authority over a church, you're still a servant. You're a servant to the Lord Jesus Christ, and you're a servant to your fellow man. And I get that. That's, that's the job. That's what we're supposed to be doing. We're the ones who are actually supposed to convey the meaning of love your neighbor as yourself. But I can tell you, the greater good is performed when you do these things because you want to. And you recognize that taking one day out of seven is, does not mean that everybody you've been working with, they're all going to leave one day. And so we have these sevens all in the Bible. The se that's where I was going. The sevens, seven vials of wrath, seven trumpets, seven seals, uh, seven heads, seven candlesticks, seven this, seven that. So you see that number seven all through the book of Revelation, but especially in concerning the trumpet judgments. And... We Again, we saw Tuesday what these trumpets, these seven trumpets, are associated with. How they can be, how you can read Revelation and then go backward into your Bible and study the foundation and the general context of what it is that you read in Revelation 11. In other words, reading the back of the book will simply send you to the beginning of the book. So if you try to skip over 90% of the stuff in the Bible and get to the book of Revelation and go, ah, that's what I'm going to read. The Holy Ghost at some point is going to nudge you and say, did you see that there? Guess where that came from? It came from the Old Testament. You, didn't, you don't know that because you didn't read it. Now go back and read it. And then you'll have understanding. So, seven, 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 seven. So we're studying the trumpets. And these trumpets sounding and initiating certain things into this world, but they themselves are not the wrath of God. They're not. They are tribulation. They are trials. They are, there's going to be persecutions. I understand that. So when we look in the Bible, going backwards, God said he's declared the end from the beginning. So if we go to Exodus, um, yeah, Exodus 19 is the first place in Scripture where a trumpet is mentioned by name. Now, I'm going to do a little searching here very quickly. And um, let's see here. Yep. Trumpet. First occurrence of the word trumpet is in Exodus 19. So let's get our Bibles out and let's do a little study here of the things that God is showing us that he's going to do in relation to the trumpets that are sounding, the seven trumpets that are sounding in the book of Revelation and what we're going to see in these stories is the prefiguring or the foreshadowing of the prophesying of the events that are going to take place, if that makes sense to you. We're looking at typology. We're looking at shadows in the Old Testament that's going to shed some light on the form and substance of what is going to happen in the future. Because we're not there yet. We're not in the seven trumpets yet. I, there's a guy, I, don't, I haven't seen him around for years. But he was making a big noise on, you know, on uh, like Christian radio stations. He had this prophecy teaching thing that he did. It was syndicated nationwide. His name was Erwin Baxter. And some of you may have heard of him. Some of you may still get his materials. Um, but I've got a problem with Erwin Baxter. Number one, 
Erwin Baxter is a united Pentecostal. So what, Pastor, you hate Pentecostals? No, that's not what I said. But the United Pentecostals are a breed apart from everybody else because they do not believe in a Godhead. They don't believe in it. They don't believe 1 John 5, 7. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. They don't believe that. I've read some of their material. I've listened to them talk. And if, if let's say, these uh, United Pentecostals come to your door and they're going to try to get you hooked into a Bible study, don't fall for it. They're not really there to do a Bible study. They're there to proselytize you. Um, but anyway, they're going to sell this thing like you really need this. You really need this teaching in order for you to truly be saved. And when you bring up 1 John 5, 7 about the Godhead, here's what they'll say. They'll say, well, we know that 1 John 5, 7 was not part of the original Bible. It wasn't there. And we know that the evil Catholic Church added the doctrine of the Godhead in 1 John 5, 7. They added that years later. So they, they could push this, and here it goes. Some of you know what I'm talking about. You have family members, friends, you have people that you people you know that have been sucked in to the sacred name, to the uh, Hebrew roots thing. You've been sucked into this stuff, and these people are telling you, "Oh, you got to keep the law. You got to do this." Okay. Um, where was I going with that? Oh, the evil Catholic Church is the one who added. The pagan doctrine of the Godhead, but where's Bible believing Christians? We're not supposed to believe that because God is one. There's not three Jesuses. I get that. There are not three gods. I get that too. But what I know for a fact about the Godhead is there are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. I may not be able to understand and comprehend that fully, but I believe it. And I don't think that simply because I can't understand it, they ought to yank that verse out of the Bible and pretend that it never should have been there. Because that's what they say. They say when you bring up, when they start saying this stuff about there is no Godhead and, and so on and so forth, you say, well, what about First John 5, 7? Their answer is going to be, that shouldn't be in the Bible. How convenient is that? And it's just like really convenient that the one verse that absolutely blasts their doctrine away just happens to be the verse that they say that shouldn't be in the Bible to begin with. But anyway, Erwin Baxter, and, and that's what, that was my biggest thing with him, is that he had his doctrine way off. And as such, he had his eschatology way off too, because he actually stated, it's been several years ago since he did this, he actually stated that he honestly felt that we were already in the midst of the trumpet judgments from Revelation 8 and 9, that we were already there. And I'm just going, ah, no, 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 you're not, no, uh, I don't believe that one. I don't buy it for a minute. Where's all the ocean water that should have turned to blood? Where is that? Where are the third of the stars that get cast out of the heavens? Where are the, when, when did that happen? It hasn't. And so these people, they have their messed up, doctrine therefore their eschatology is going to be messed up so it's better to hear from god and it's doubly better to hear from god through the pages of the written word of god that's where it, that's where it comes into play that's what's important right here what does the word of God say? So in Exodus, where are we going? Exodus 19. Um, let me get there. If you remember Exodus 20 is where the, uh, the oral Ten Commandments are given to mankind. Um, let's see here. Yeah, they're given to mankind. Um, you'll have to excuse me. I've, I've been talking to somebody this morning. My mind is running a hundred miles, it's running faster than my mouth. 
So I'm trying to slow my mind down a little bit so I can remember what it is that I was telling you. But Exodus 20, they're going to meet with God. God's going to give them the Ten Commandments orally. But Exodus 19 is how God gathered them together. Just to give you a little background on Exodus 19, turn to Exodus 14. Exodus 14 is God telling Moses to take the Israelites and have them go at, and camp at Pihahiroth next to the Red Sea. So Moses led the people there to this beach area at the edge of the Red Sea. They got the sea to the east, and then God hardens Pharaoh's heart, drags him over there. And Pharaoh's now going, I'm going to kill every Jew. I'm going to kill every one of them. They're not going to get away with this. I don't want my enemies thinking that I'm weak and impotent. And if I let all my slaves go, what are they going to say about me? So God hardened his heart. He said, I'm going to kill every last Jew that there is on the face of the earth. And so he comes riding with his chariots over to attack and kill the Israelites. And they cried out unto the Lord. And God opened up the Red Sea. And Israel passed through that. And God led Pharaoh to follow after Israel. It's like Israel was the bait. Right? Israel's the bait. I'm going to dangle the bait in front of you. And I dare you, Pharaoh, to come chasing after him. And God pulled him through the Red Sea. And then when Pharaoh's chariot started to drive hard down into the dry ground at the bottom of the Red Sea, all of a sudden, God made their wheels come off their chariots. It's kind of hard to drag a chariot around with no wheels on it, which basically stopped them in their tracks, which basically prevented them from turning around and going back so that they wouldn't get drowned. And now that they're stuck out in the middle of the Red Sea, God just closed the waters in on top of them and killed them. So the whole point of the whole Red Sea thing and so on in Exodus 14 is so that God could bring his people Israel to the base of Mount Sinai where God was going to meet his people. Now again, I want you to keep this in mind. The seven trumpets, they're clearly told to us in Revelation 8 and 9 what exactly they are. But then the Old Testament is going to shed more light upon what the New Testament is saying so that we can see it much more, much more clearly, or we can see it more, better. So God brings them to the base of Mount Sinai. Let's see here. Exodus 19. And he says, let's pick it up in verse 3, Exodus 19. Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thou shalt say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, verse 4, You have seen what I did unto you, the Egyptians, and how I bear you in eagle's wings, and brought you unto myself. Now, here's what I want you to remember. The sounding of the seven trumpets and their purpose lies in typology. The picture of what God wants us to see that is going to take place has already been drawn for us in the stories of the Old Testament. And these stories, my friend, have to be true because if they're not true, neither is Christ's second coming. So there they are. God is drawing his people to himself. I am one of those. What are you talking about, Mike? I am one of those that no longer believes that nothing of any biblical importance whatsoever happens before the rapture. I used to think that way. I don't think that way anymore. They say the rapture must happen first and then all these other things are going to happen. I don't see that. What I see uh, I can't remember if I did this Tuesday or last night, but what I see is God gathering the people, which would be us, the Gentile church, the saints of God. We are called up 
to meet the dead in Christ who are already in the air. And this happens at the last trump. The last trump. What is the last trump? Some would say the last trump is Revelation chapter 4, where John heard a voice behind him that sounded like a trumpet. He turned around, he saw Jesus. Now, I will say, there's no doubt in my mind that when John saw Jesus, he knew where the source of the sound like a trumpet was coming from. He knew that source. Um, let's see here. I ain't kidding you. My mind is just running all over the place. And now I'm freezing. Hang on, I'm to turn my air conditioner down a little bit. Yeah, there's an app for that. Let me see. I'm going the wrong way. There we go. Ta-da. All right. So anyway, I think our translation takes place at the seventh trumpet. Again, some people believe that it's Revelation 4 and Jesus' voice as a trumpet saying, come up hither. So they say, see, that's the last trumpet of the church age, even though it doesn't say that. Um, but I just, I, I have to stick with what I believe the scriptures is telling us that we're not going to be caught up into the clouds to meet Jesus in the air until the last trump or the seventh trump. Because what does the seventh trump do? The seventh trump brings in the seven vials of wrath. Now, I know for a fact that God has not appointed us under wrath. So I do not believe in any way, shape, or form that us as the Gentile believers of Christ are going to have to endure the wrath of God. That's not, that's not what God said. But are we appointed to be persecuted? Yes. Are we appointed to suffer for the cause of Christ? Yes. And so I just think that seventh trumpet that sounds, Revelation, I think it's Revelation 11. Actually, it's, it's mentioned in Revelation 10 that in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin, begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished. And I think that's where I left you off with on Tuesday was I told you to study the mystery and look at what happens in relation to the mystery that's spoken of all through the, all through the New Testament. That mystery is going to be finished, and I think part of that is, behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all be asleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. So I believe that our gathering together unto Jesus Christ takes place in the days of the seventh trumpet when the mystery of God is going to be finished it's going to be over with and now all the jews are going to know who the messiah is of course we already know and we're with jesus so with that in mind let's look at exodus 19 verse oh let's see here let's go to verse go to verse 9 of of exodus 19 the lord said unto moses lo i come into thee in a thick cloud Stop right here. Where's Jesus coming? When he's coming, what's going to be the sign of his coming? Thick clouds. As Jesus left in the clouds, so he's coming back in the cloud. Okay? And here, Exodus 19.9, God said unto Moses, I come to thee in a thick cloud. This, I think, foreshadows the appearance of Christ in the clouds, the dead in Christ brought up first, then we which are alive and remain. To meet Jesus where he is, which is in the clouds. I love, I love this. So just that one verse, Moses, lo, I come unto thee in a thick cloud. Right then and there. 
I believe that you have a connection then with the glorious appearing of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Because he, behold, he, he went up in a cloud, he's coming back in a cloud. And here is God meeting Moses as God is in this cloud. And we all know the reason why God is in that cloud. Because if Israel just simply ran because um, they were afraid of God's voice, what do you think it's going to be like if they actually saw God's face on Mount Sinai? You talk about slain in the spirit, bud. It would slaughter the people of Israel. If in our flesh bodies we were to ever gaze upon the very face of God, we would die instantly. Wouldn't be able to handle it. So God comes down covered up in a cloud. And um, so he tells Moses, I come to the end of the thick cloud, verse 9, that the people may hear when I speak with thee and believe thee forever. And Moses told the words of the people unto the Lord. See, he's the mediator. They asked Moses, Moses, will you beseech God for us that we've been bit by these serpents? Is there, some, is there a remedy that we can do? They're praying. They want God to answer the prayer, but they're praying it through the mediator, Moses. And now here, the mediator is working in the opposite direction. He goes up to meet God. God gives him his words. Moses then comes down with those words and transmit those words to the people of Israel. If you have ever done any study in the Hebrew roots, Kabbalah cults, you'll remember that according to the Kabbalah, the uh, Jews believed and taught that Jesus, again, I, I am, my mind is used, okay, it's just one of those days. I, I start to say something and immediately Lose track of where I'm going. Anyway, we'll get back to the scriptures. That way I don't mess it all up too bad. In verse 10, the Lord said unto Moses, go ye unto the people. Okay, God now is speaking to the people of Israel through Moses as Israel spoke to God through Moses. Moses is the prototype mediator. Christ is the real mediator. Who, in the day of the Lord, he's going to come down from heaven in the clouds, just like in Exodus 19. So Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord. That's Moses carrying the petitions of the people of Israel to God. The God then saying, Moses, tell them what I say. So the mediator always acts both ways. We pray through Jesus to God. God speaks to man through Jesus, the mediator. Uh, let's see here. Verse 10. Now we have a time prophecy associated with God appearing in the clouds. In verse 10, the Lord said unto Moses, go into the people and sanctify them today and tomorrow and let them wash their clothes and be ready against the third day. And I'll never forget when I started looking at that and I'm going, wait a minute. It's been like 2,000 years since Jesus came the first time. Literally, a day with the Lord is as a 1,000 years, and a 1,000 years is as one day. So be ready against the third day. Think of uh, when Abraham was leading Isaac to Mount Moriah, which is where Jerusalem is. God telling Abraham to offer up his, his only son, and that's exactly what Abraham did. He fulfilled what God said because he offered him. He didn't kill him. God didn't say to kill him. He offered him. And so Moses, or excuse me, Abraham did that. And the Bible says that they had traveled two days. And on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. He was looking into the future. And do you not realize that between the time of Abraham to the time of Christ was two days or 2,000 years? And here we have the same time prof prophecy. After two days, on the third day, I'm going to reveal myself to all my people, and they're going to know who I am. He's going to do it on the third day. In Hosea, chapter 6, the Bible says um, after, let's see, I, I better read it. My mind ain't as sharp as I want it to be today. Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea. At least I remember where all the books of the Bible are.
Hmm. Now if I can just find what I was looking for. Hmm. Oh, yeah, that is. Hosea 6, 2. After two days, will he revive us? In the third day, he will raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. A time prophecy of after two days. On the third day, God is going to raise back from the dead Israel. And the two days are the 2,000 years since Christ came and offered himself on Mount Moriah as the sacrificial lamb. Now, two days later, I believe that we are very near the fulfillment of all the third day time prophecies that are in the Bible. What day did Jesus rise from the dead? Israel rises from the dead, third day. Moses is going to take the Israelites to meet God on the third day. And that, to me, is rendered from the time of the first coming of Christ to the time of the second coming of Christ. Literally, after two days on the third day, early in the morning, let's say. This is when God is going to introduce himself to the people of Israel and they're going to know that that's their God. And it's not going to be a question to them any longer. Neither will they save the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord because they won't need it. Because the real Ark of the Covenant is in heaven and it has Jesus' blood on it and that blood is everlasting. So does Jesus have to re-die again in order to save Israel? No, because he died once for all. Okay, So you're given a, a three-day time prophecy in the relation to this story. So back at the ranch... Exodus 19, be ready against the third day, for the third day the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. Do you see the language? On the third day the Lord will come down. Whew. Therefore the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God. So this story in Exodus is not just a factual rendering of a historical event. It is also a prophetic voice showing us the future. Because Solomon has already told us in his wisdom, Solomon searched this out and he said, I got it figured out. You want to know what God is going to do? Look back at what God has done. There's this skewed up idea floating around in the internet that the God who is God now of the New Testament is not the same God that's in the Old Testament. It's the same God. Okay. And so how if God says, I'm going to do six things. Uh, I'll, I'll say it like this. If God said to you or if I said to you, I'm going to give you six numerical equation problems. I'm only going to give you five of them. And I want to see if you can guess the sixth one. So here it goes. The first problem is two plus four equals six. The second one is 2 plus 4 equals 6. The third one is 4 plus 2 equals 6. Okay, you see the pattern here? The fourth one is 2 plus 4 equals 6. The fifth one, 2 plus 4 equals 6. Uh, then the seventh, or the, excuse me, the sixth one. I've given you the first five, and all the first five are the exact same equations. So if then I were to tell you, can you guess what the next equation is going to be? You could say it's either going to be 2 plus 4 or 4 plus 2. 
because both of them equal six. And you'll go, yep, very good. You win the prize. And that's what we see in the scriptures. God says, if I'm going to do 10 things in the earth, I'm going to show you the first nine of them so that when I say to you, what do you think I'm going to do the 10th time? We could say, well, we know, God, that you're the same yesterday, today, forever. You're God and you change not. So I would say if you did it this way nine previous times, I think it's a, just a surefire bet that you're going to do it exactly that same way the 10th time. God is consistent. And God is revealing his nature and his plan in these Old Testament stories. Verse 12. Thou shalt set bounds unto the people round about, saying, Take heed to yourselves that ye go not up into the mount or touch the border of it. Whosoever toucheth the mount shall surely be put to death. There shall not in hand touch it, but he shall surely be stoned or shot through. Whether it be beast or man, it shall not live. Verse 13. Look at this. Look at your Bible. I'm not even going to put it on the screen for you. I want you to get your Bible out. I want you to underline this with your pen, your highlighter or whatever it is. When the trumpet soundeth long, they shall come up to the mount. Do you see it? You see the language? Think of this as a future event. God said on the third day he's going to gather the people together. And at the, when they hear the sound of the trumpet, then and only then am I going to, get, going to gather my people to myself. Okay? And what you have here is a foreshadowing of the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain. God literally calling his people up to him and God did not come all the way down to the valley that they were all in, did he? No. He met them in the air. On top of a mountain. Sort of like the middle place between earth and heaven. Jesus is going to ascend down or descend down. We are going to ascend up and meet Jesus in the air. And this is what you see in Exodus 19. Verse 14. So we have the trumpet here. The trumpet soundeth long. So remember, in uh, Revelation 10, you have the mighty angel with the little book in his hand, and he sets his one foot on the sea, one foot on the, on the land, and he swears that time shall be no longer. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, then the mystery of God is finished, as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. God's going to fulfill a ton of scriptures on that third day time prophecy. Okay. When the trumpet soundeth long, they shall come up to the mount. It's almost like Moses was reading what the apostle Paul had written. Well, we know that's not possible, right? But what if God revealed to Moses what the apostle Paul was going to say? Okay, then Moses knows what the Apostle Paul is going to say, that we're going to meet Jesus in the clouds at the sound of the trumpet. All right. So verse 14, and Moses went down from the mount unto the people and sanctified the people and they washed their clothes. The sanctification means being made free from their spots and their blemishes of sin. Wash their clothes. Look at Revelation 19. It was granted to her that she should be arrayed in fine linen, white and clean. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Not the righteous deeds of the saints, but the righteousness of the saints. It was granted to her that she should be clothed upon with this. And Moses specifically mentions to the Israelites, put on your garments and wash those clothes so that you present yourself as clean when we go meet God at Mount Sinai. Um, now verse 16. And it came to pass on the third day. There it is. In the morning. There it is. It's not happening late on the third day. Because that would seem to indicate maybe the end of the thousand year or the seventh day. It happens 
early in the morning. The very beginning of the last 1,000 years, God's going to do this thing as he enacted it out in the days of Moses. It came to pass on the third day, this is verse 16, in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. So what do you have? You have the Lord appearing in the clouds. You have the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud. And you have in verse 17, Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't, this, isn't the language of the King James Bible absolutely beautiful? Because if you read this and you get it, doodads will pop up on your neck and maybe maybe you might even shed a tear or two. Because you'll know that you are never worthy to receive the riches of the Word of God. And yet, God chose you to share those riches with. Mm. Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the nether part of the mount. And the Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in fire, have you not heard of the fire baptism? The Holy Ghost, John said, you know, he, sh you know, he, sh the Holy Ghost shall baptize you in repentance, but he who is to come shall baptize you with fire. Our God is a consuming fire. So here is the fire of God coming down, descending from heaven, and hidden in that cloud is none other than Jesus Himself who hides himself from Israel so they cannot identify him. Only to four or five thousand years later, he's going to reveal himself once again to the people. Only they're not going to see Moses under there. They're going to see Jesus. <clears throat> uh, the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace. You can see that in Revelation 9. The sounding of the fifth trumpet. And... The angel who has the key of the bottomless pit, opens the key, opens up the, uh, with the key, opens it up the door of the pit. And these locusts come pouring out of that pit in the smoke that is from the pit, like it was from a great furnace. Think about the opposite. The Lord is going to descend down from heaven. These devils are going to ascend up. From, from hell itself, from the lower parts of the earth. It's the opposite, isn't it? And God is all about the opposite. See how much different Satan is from me? See how much better my Bible is than all these other trashy perversions? God is all about contrasting himself against Satan and his kingdom. But, out of the five elements that were given in First Thessalonians 4, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together uh, in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. So out of all of those things, in Exodus 19, you have the third day, you have the thick cloud upon the mount, and God is in that cloud, you have the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud. So you have the trumpets. And then you have the gathering of God's people together to meet God on that day. Okay. The only thing missing here is the Lord descending from heaven with a shout. Okay. That's, you don't see that here. But what we do see is a partial foreshadowing of the event surrounding the translation of the church from life into better life without seeing death. It's taking place on the third day. It's taking place when Jesus appears in the clouds. And it's going to take place in association with the sounding of the last trumpet. 
Okay. Had a guy at our church ask me, he said, Pastor, I, he said, maybe you can help me out with something. I said, okay. He said, you know, I come from a background where the only true rapture is the pre-tribulational pre, pre rapture. And he said, if you don't believe that, well, you can't even join their church. And I said, yeah, I know that. You know, I, I love them. I don't agree with them, but I love them. I'm, obviously, I'm not going to promote what it is that they're saying because I don't believe in what they're saying. But a lot of these fundamental churches are still holding fast to the King James, and they're not about to let it go anytime soon. And for that reason, I don't feel the need to come out and try to destroy their ministries. Okay, But I do believe that they have it wrong in thinking that nothing can happen before the rapture, but that's not what I see in the scriptures. What I see in the scriptures is Jesus appearing in the clouds, the trumpet sounding, dead in Christ rising, the gathering of the people, that's what I see in the scriptures. Okay. Um, verse 19, And when the voice of the trumpet sounded long, and waxed louder and louder. Moses spake, and God answered him by a voice. And the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai. Look at that. <laughs> the Lord called Moses up to the top of the mount, and Moses went up. And so now, as Paul Harvey would say, now you know the rest of the story. Paul Harvey... Good day. Uh, let's see here. Exodus 20. You see it again in Exodus 20. If you want to follow along with me and know where I'm going, use the Pure Bible Search software. Type in the word Trump or trumpet with an asterisk. That way you're going to get trumpet and trumpets together. And the next place we find it is in the next chapter, Exodus 20, verse 18. The Bible says, And all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet. And the mountain smoking, when they saw it, they removed and stood afar off. Remember, far, afar off has to do with not only distance, but I think it has to do with time, too. They're staying way behind the day that God came down upon Mount Sinai and turned the top of that mountain into charcoal. So... Um, the people saw it, they removed it, verse 18, and they said unto Moses, Speak thou with us, we, are, we will hear, but let not God speak with us, lest we die. So, let me ask you a question. In the last days, is it God the Father himself going to leave his throne and come down here to gather his children together? No. He's sending his ambassador. He's sending his mediator. And his mediator is our shepherd, and we know his voice. And my friends, I promise you something. If you will set about yourself to diligently search the scriptures, just read them. Read them, and then let God catch your attention on certain things whenever he's ready to. But just read the scriptures, okay? I promise you that in the day that God turns everybody else over to a reprobate mind, he won't do that to you. And he will not allow you to be deceived. We are going to believe his son, our shepherd, Jesus Christ, because we know his voice. And if some hireling came along and tried to steal the sheep away from Jesus, we're sheep. We don't know who this guy is. But he doesn't talk like you, so we're not going to follow him. Their master's voice had been implanted into their brains, and those sheep only responded to their shepherd. No other man. I um, First time I ever encountered a police dog, I uh, was walking into a convenience mart one morning, and the German shepherd police dog was sitting out in the squad car barking his head off. Everybody that walked by, he would just lay into them. And the car was parked right next to the door, and I went in, and I saw that deputy there. And when I opened the door, he heard the dog barking, and he said, rawr, 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 something in German. And I went, okay, that's weird. And I asked him, I said, what language was that you were speaking to the dog? He said, it's German. 
I said, really? I said, why German? And he said, duh, they're German shepherds. They only speak German. No, it's not what he said. What he said was, it's because these dogs came from Germany. They were trained in Germany by German trainers. And the policemen who were going to take over these dogs and work with them were taught the words, the German words, that would cause these dogs to obey their master's voice. And simply put, the, one of the reasons behind training dogs in other countries with commands in other languages is so that some bad guy cannot command a police dog to do something because he doesn't know the German words. And that dog speaks German. And I went, oh, that makes a lot of sense. So anyway, I believe that when Jesus appears, we're going to know him because we know his voice. And when the false Jesus comes on the scene, God will not let you be deceived. He won't. Okay. That if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Now, the Bible is not saying that they're only going to, they're not, they're only not going to deceive the higher grade saints. But the lower grade church people, they might get deceived. There is no such thing. There is no such thing as levels of Christianity. Now, there are maturities in Christianity, but there are no levels. And God's not saying the very elect to say that, well, these are very elect. They're more elect than these other people. That's not what God is saying. Very, very means truly. The truly elect, if it were possible, they shall deceive the truly elect. But what that's really saying is they're not going to be able to deceive those who are the elect of God. Because we know our shepherd's voice. And some other voice we won't listen to. Because that's not our shepherd. So there's another Christ coming, a fake one. And I think a lot of people are going to fall for this. Okay, You and I don't have to. And we're not going to. Because God is going to give us his voice and we're going to know that it's our shepherd um let's see here is that all i wanted yeah verse 19 again speak thou with us and we will hear but let not god speak with us lest we die and then what was i in, in exodus 20 verse 18 and oh, that's 21 yeah okay i already read that let's go to oh let's see here where else can we go I, i'm going to run out of time here in a little bit Okay, Joshua chapter 6, turn there. Joshua chapter 6. Here's another trumpet story. Only this one, there are actually seven trumpets that sound on the seventh day. I keep going from freezing to sweating in this little room a couple years ago i had some new vents put in this room because it doesn't get the air that the rest of this part of the church gets and i had the guy put it right over my seat and he did and the air that comes through this vent is like colder than antarctica and it's blowing right on top of me so sometimes i'll get too cold sometimes i'll get too hot that's just my life all right joshua chapter six uh you know what i want to do i want to look back in verse 13 of joshua chapter five uh verse 13 it came to pass when joshua was by jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked behold there stood a man over against him with a sword drawn in his hand who to man and joshua went unto him and said unto him art thou for us or for our adversaries and he said, Nay, but as the captain of the host of the Lord am I now come. 
I believe that this was Jesus pre-Bethlehem. Before he was born in Bethlehem, I believe this was Jesus, the captain of the host. Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship. You see, that's why I believe that's Jesus. Jesus accepted men's worship of him. Angels do not accept that. That's evidence in the book of Revelation. John bowed before this angel that was showing him all these things. And the angel said, no, nah, don't do that because I'm just like you. I'm a created being just like you. So don't bow to me. Let's give our reverence to our father. Okay. So this is the captain of the host. This is Jesus. Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship. By the way, he fell on his face to the earth. That's the same thing that Goliath did. You remember that day when Goliath was worshiping Jesus? Well, okay, he didn't really do that, but a stone sunk into his forehead, and the Bible says he fell on his face to the earth, face first. Face plant, okay? Anyway, um, the captain of the, the Goliath was bowing down before the future king of Israel. When he fell on his face to the earth. So verse 14, Joshua fell on his face to the earth, did worship and said unto him, what saith my Lord unto his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, loose thy shoe from off thy foot for the place wherein thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. There's another clue to the identity of this angel. Were it just a created angel, number one, he would not have uh, Joshua would not have bowed down to him. And even if Joshua would have, the angel would have stood him back up and said, you're going to get us both in trouble. But then this angel tells Joshua, take those sandals off. You're on holy ground. The only other time we know that happened is when Moses encountered the angel of the Lord in the burning bush. It at first says that it was the angel of the Lord. And then right after that, it says God spoke to him out of the burning bush. So who is it that's in the burning bush? Okay, the captain of the host, the, the uh, angel of the Lord, which was God. Jesus, before being born at Bethlehem, is showing up here and saying this land is holy land. And you need to take your shoes off like I told Moses to take his shoes off. You need to take your shoes off because this is holy ground you're standing on. And I think Joshua knew and realized that he was standing in front of God himself. But I don't think it was God the Father because the sight of him would have killed Joshua. But it was the mediator, Jesus Christ, who has the right to go to both parties and say, God, here's what they said. And then God says, well, tell them that I said this. And he comes back and he says, okay, right here in the Bible, God says this. Okay, that's the job of the mediator. So he's talking to the captain of the host and he's, you know, there in the wilderness and Joshua has to take his shoes off. Now, chapter six. The Bible says, verse one, now Jericho was straightly shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. And the Lord said unto Joshua, see, I have given unto thine hand Jericho and the king thereof and the mighty men of valor. And ye shall compass the city, all ye men of war, and go round about the city once. Thus shalt thou do six days. Get that in mind. How long is a day with the Lord? It's a thousand years. So you have a day for a thousand years. And for six days, six thousand years, the Israelites march one time a day. Okay. Sunday morning, they get up, they line up, they march around the city of Jericho and they're carrying the Ark of the Covenant. Day two, they rise up early in the morning, march around the city of Jericho one time with the Ark of the Covenant. Day three, same thing. Day four, day five, day six, same thing. One time a day for six days. That six days is a period of six thousand years you can render that from adam now i know 
that evolutionists do not like it when Christians talk about creation. They think we're all stupid nitwits, simpletons with our teeth, bug teeth hanging out because we don't ever floss or brush. We don't take care of ourselves. We're just a bunch of redneck hillbillies who don't know anything. But I want to tell you something. If you actually believe that God created the universe in six days, 6,000 years ago, you're smarter than the best physicist in the world. Because you have the truth and know the truth of the creation of this world. Um, so, verse 3 again, thus shalt you do six days. So, one time a day for six days, they march around the city of Jericho. The first day, you can imagine the guards on the guard towers of the wall of Jericho. They see the Israelites mustering and they start blowing their own trumpet. And they're going, men of war, gather together. Here come the Israelites. And so the Israelites march around the city of Jericho. And the Jericho people all got their spears and their swords and their bows and arrows. They're ready to go, man. As soon as you touch that wall, we're going to mow you down. So they marched around Jericho and then they went back home. And the captains of the guard that are on the wall there, Jericho, are going, see, we scared them off, didn't we? Yeah, they were afraid to come near us, weren't they? The second day, they did it again, and they're ready for them. Third day, they did it again. And maybe these guards at Jericho are going, you know what? I'm not in the mood to fall for this again. So, I mean, I'll keep my bow and arrow next to me, but I'm not going to stand here with it drawn for two hours straight. Because they didn't show up the last two days. They're certainly not going to come in today. So they did it Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, one time a day for six days. That was early in the morning. And then when they got done, they went back to their tents and their dwellings and carried about the day as usual until day seven. Verse four, Joshua chapter six, the seven priests shall bear before the ark seven trumpets. Underline that in your Bible. Make a little marginal note. Revelation 8 and 9. Seven trumpets. The priest shall bear before the ark seven trumpets of ram's horns. And on the seventh day ye shall compass the city seven times, and the priest shall blow with the trumpets. And it shall come to pass that when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when ye hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout. Look at that! There was no shouting that you could see in Exodus 19 and 20. But they're shouting here. On the seventh day, the children of Israel were given trumpets. And they marched around Jericho seven times and blew one of those trumpets so that when it was all said and done as the seventh trumpet is sounding all of a sudden the guy standing on the wall of Jericho noticed that the mortar is coming loose between the blocks that made up that wall and they're starting to get a little bit concerned because, guys, we just built this wall five years ago. We heard Israel's coming, we, so we went about to build a wall to keep them out. So they're standing there thinking that their wall is going to save them. And it didn't. And it's not going to. In fact, a wall represents salvation, right? God has appointed uh, salvation for walls and bulwarks. That's my rough translation of that verse. But the men of Jericho are basing their salvation on something that God is going to make it collapse right under their feet. Whew. It would be interesting if God allowed us, once we were translated, to look down on the earth just to see how many churches 
still had a large portion of their membership on the earth after the translation. Now, I'm not saying that if, well, if you go to my United Methodist Church, you are going to hell. There's no way around it. I'm not saying that. Because there are some very faithful people in various denominations. But by and large, these churches are full of wicked people. And when the trumpet sounds and God causes us to come up in the air, they're not going anywhere. They're staying right there on the earth and God's going to pour out his vials of wrath upon them. What a shame, because it doesn't have to be that way. They could read the Bible just like you and I and ask God for help. I got to move on because I'm going to have to leave here in a minute. But um, so they have seven trumpets of ram's horns. And they march around the city seven times and the priest shall blow with the trumpets. So you have seven trumpets here in this story and you have a shout. And it shall come to pass that when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, when you hear the sound of the trumpet and all the people shall shout with a great shout and the wall of the city shall fall down flat, every man straight and, and the people shall ascend up. Look at this. Look at this. This is cool. You have the sounding of the trumpets, the seven trumpets. And you have a shout, and you have the people ascending up. Oh, I love this. Can you imagine if you, maybe you're just hearing this for the first time, and you're going, I have never heard anything like that in my life. That a, that's how it's supposed to feel. Here this story was in this Bible all the time. And we didn't quite put it together. And now in these last days, God is letting people all over the world see things I've never seen before. Right there, plainly written in the scriptures. But it, it makes us excited when we hear about these wondrous things that are in our Bible. How that instead of just reading 1 Thessalonians 4 to try to get a rapture understanding of that, we go to other places in the Bible because God's going to fill in the details. So here's Israel, seven trumpets. Shouting, ascending up. Okay. Um, and the Jericho, let's see if I can find this verse. Oh, let's see here. No, 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 no. Ah, Jeremiah 51 58. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the broad walls of Babylon shall be utterly broken. And her high gate shall be burned with fire and the people shall labor in vain and the folk in the fire. They shall be weary. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, Jeremiah 50 verse 15. Shout against her roundabout. She has given her hand. Her foundations are fallen. Her walls are thrown down. For it is the vengeance of the Lord. Take vengeance upon her as she hath done do unto her. So in Jeremiah 50, Jeremiah 51, 12, Jeremiah 51, 18, we see that the walls of Babylon fall and are utterly destroyed. This basically is a picture of Mystery Babylon the Gate, the mother of the great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth, being cast down by the Antichrist and his ten kings in the last days. They hate her. They're tired of her. So they bring her down to destruction in the last days. And I think what God's signifying in this passage is all these kingdoms of the world. Most of them, most of them despise me, meaning God. And so God is going to destroy them. And his only begotten son is going to come down and reign over those cities. And God's going to destroy them first. The walls of Jericho are going to fall down. The seven trumps are going to sound. The people are going to shout with a great shout. And the people are going to ascend up. Wow. Man, I love that. 
So let me read this very quickly. Um, verse 10, Joshua had commanded the people saying, you shall not shout nor make any noise with your voice. Neither shall any word proceed out of your mouth until the day I bid you shout. Then shall ye shout. I think signifying to us that the rapture has not already taken place. The shouting did not take place until day seven. When the seven trumpets are sounded all in one day. That's when the shouting takes place. And that's when the walls of Jericho fall. Babylon is fallen. Is fallen. God is going to have Babylon destroyed in the last days. At the sound of the trumpet. That's what Jericho represents. Mm -mm -mm. So when God says, come out from among, among her and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Did God really mean that? Sure he did. Because these two spies, Joshua sent these two men working for the Jewish Mossad, the CIA, and they went in and spied out the city. They were pretending to be just weary travelers. They didn't let on that they were Jews. And so they spied the city out. They wanted to know what was going on inside, how, how much their defenses were and so on. And word got around that two spies from the people of the Hebrews had made it into town. And so the king of Jericho went ransacking every house to try to find these two spies so he could kill them. And those men happened upon the house of Rahab the harlot built into the wall itself. Rahab's apartment was actually part of the outer wall of Jericho. So when the walls fell, her house fell too. Meaning, there's a, boy, there's a good illustration with this. The, the best things God has ever done for me is to destroy the bridge that would have connected me back to my past. They say, you know, when you when you leave a church, you really shouldn't burn all the bridges. Because you never know, you might be right back in this church again. After some issue has died down and settled, you might be. And if you burn all the bridges, there's just no chance of you going back. Well, that's the point, though. God made sure that when I and this church left the former denomination that we were a part of, he has made sure that we never go back. And we never have. And we're not going to. There's nothing for us there. So let God burn the bridges. Let God tear everything down because... There just isn't anything for us left. So when the two spies told Rahab what was going to happen, Rahab said, will you make a promise? She said, I'll hide you if you'll make a promise to me. And they said, what is it? When you raid this town, will you promise me that you will save me and my family? So that we're not killed with everybody else. And the two spies said, here, take this scarlet cord. Tie it on the doorpost outside of your apartment. Now I'm going to instruct the armies of Israel that as we're going through the town, killing and pillaging and everything else, burning and looting and all that stuff. When our soldiers go through, when they see this scarlet cord, Everybody that's in that house is going to live. Now, Rahab, I don't care if it's your firstborn son. If he decides to leave in the day that God destroys this city, I promise you he's going to be destroyed with this city. And Rahab said, we'll do it. You can, you trust us. And so I'm going to hide you out. And so... She had a bunch of stalks upon the roof of her apartment 
And she told the guys, lay down in these stalks and I'll cover you up. So when the soldiers come by looking for you, they're not going to find you. They're not going to think to look there. And sure enough, she, I want you to get this. She hid the two witnesses. She hid them so they could not be destroyed. Do you get what I'm saying? The two witnesses, you know what their names were? Old Testament and New Testament. That sounds funny in English. I can't think it sounds better in Hebrew. Okay, Mechoyim and Mechayim. All right? Or something like that. So she hid them. She hid the two witnesses in her house. Your house is your body. They represent Old and New Testament. David said, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Man, I gotta keep, I gotta say this. The two witnesses represent your Bible, right? And the king of Jericho is looking for these two witnesses. Why? He does not want them reporting back to Joshua about what's going on in the city. And besides that, they are enemy spies, and we're going to treat them like any enemies of ours. We're going to kill them. Now you think about it. What is the one thing that saved Rahab and her house? Her trust in the two witnesses. And that's good. So therefore... What does the king of Jericho despise more than anything? The two witnesses. And he seeks relentlessly to destroy those two witnesses. So they have no impact whatsoever. Isn't that neat? When you think about it, the two witnesses representing the two testaments of your Bible... Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. And the devil goes about looking for the word of God to devour it. And get rid of it. But he's not going to be able to. Let's say that, you know, when the New World Order hits the fan, that... Um, again, I'm drawing a blank. Anyway... Let's, okay, let's say that when the New World Order takes over, they are actually going to go from house to house looking for all the Bibles. They're going to try to get rid of all the King James Bibles all over the world. Will they be able to do it? No. Well, why not? They're books, right? They burn with Peyton, you know, they burn, right? Mm -mm. God has taken his word and hid it in a place that the devil will never have access to. And that is the throne of God in our four-chamber heart. And just as Rahab hid the two witnesses, so we also hide the word of God in our hearts so that there is absolutely no chance whatsoever of the word of God being completely eradicated. Okay? But anyway, the scarlet cord, when they saw the scarlet cord, they saved her and her house. And this was establishing the doctrine of salvation by grace through faith. She actually believed what the two spies told her, that God's going to destroy this city and everything in it. And so here we get back to uh, the passage in uh, 2 Corinthians 6. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And so God, at some point in the days of the sounding of the seven trumpets, when the shouting takes place, you get that? You get that? On that day, God is going to save all of those who have put their trust in God's word. While he destroys everybody else. 
He's going to make sure and save his people, just like he saved Rahab. Rahab was saved, not by her works. Because it was pointed out, you remember what Rahab did when the soldiers came by? Uh, we're looking for these two men. Uh, you'd be able to re uh, you of all people would be able to recognize them because they're circumcised. Okay? And she's going, two men? I, I don't know. I have men in here all the time. What, what do you, what, you, two men? Really? I've had like five in here all at once. So don't tell me about two men. I practically know all the men in this town. So what are two men? And she lied through her teeth to keep those guards turned another direction so they wouldn't find the two witnesses. And yet, God saved her. Does that mean that God wants us to lie to protect him? No. It means that even though she lied, and I bet you she was good at it. After all, she's a harlot. And harlots always know things about husbands that their wives don't know. And in order for her to remain in business, she's built to herself a reputation that she does not tell secrets. Okay? But she deliberately lied to these policemen or whoever that was looking for these two witnesses. She deliberately lied to them. So we're saved by sin? No. We're saved in spite of sin. It's not her works of righteousness that saved her. It was her faith because she believed the two witnesses and what they said about what's going to happen to Jericho. Jericho has fallen, is fallen. Wherefore, come out from among her and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Well, that's just a, and that's just a tip of the iceberg, people. I love it. I wish I could spend more time here. I got to go for a doctor's appointment, and I may not find anything out today, but if I do, I, I, you know I'll make an announcement of some type if they're, if they're going to like do surgery on me. or something. I don't think it's going to be in time soon because we're going to Arkansas next week, Prophecy Roadshow, Garfield, Arkansas, uh, and then uh, we've got the Indiana Roadshow coming up in October. Yay! So... If anything, I'm going to try to wait until after, let's say, the month of October. But anyway, you pray for me because, boy, it sure hurts sometimes. All right? I love you. Study the rest of the trumpets in the Bible. Uh, look at Joel. Look at Joel. Okay? Daniel 11. Think Bible, people. I love you.